I was preparing, there was a lot of things going on, and I, boy, I sat down, and I had it laid out. I had a message laid out, and I thought, this is it, I'm going to hammer them. I've got, I've got this one. And so I was, I was, I told Mandy, I said, I'm going to stay up tonight, and I'm going to, I'm going to finish this, and uh, I said, it won't take me long, I'll be to bed, you know, probably about 30, 45 minutes. Well, about one o'clock that morning, I got in the bed, and Mandy kind of woke up and she's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I just got through working on my sermon. And she said, I didn't think it was going to take long. I said, well, the one I was working on didn't, but the, one that he, the new one that he gave me took a while. And I still didn't finish it. I had to, I had to get up the next morning and, and finish it out. But, you know, sometimes what I think the Lord wants me to say, and actually what he wants me to say is two different things. Two different things. Sometimes I have to study what I think he wants me to say so I can get to what he truly wants me to say or to get to what he wants to say. So we're going to start in Isaiah 35, verses 3 through 6. And we're going to end up going and spending most of our time in Luke but as I was preparing, this, I guess this scripture right here, when I was uh, 
studying for the other message that y'all might get one day, I come across this particular scripture, and it spoke to me. And it said, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. That tells me that in the church we have weak hands. We have people that are not serving Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, as they should. Or maybe they are struggling in their walk with the Lord. Maybe some things are going on in this world around them that, that have brought them down. They're weak. And they need to be strengthened. They need to be lifted up. And he says, make firm the feeble knees so that we can move forward, so that we can progress in our pronouncing the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world, but, but also so that we can get on our knees and pray. Now, I know that this church is a praying church. We have seen it through the years. When y'all pray for people, things happen. God moves when this church prays for people. But I want to encourage us to keep moving in that direction. He says, and make firm the feeble knees. If your knees are hurting and they're sore, the last thing you want to do is get on them. So we want to make sure that we have strong knees so that we can not only go out into the world and preach the gospel, but so that we can humble ourselves in prayer to an almighty God. Next verse. Say to those who are fear, fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Now I would dare to say that there are people here today that have a fearful heart. And sometimes doubt creeps into your life and you say, Lord, I don't know if you can handle this. You may not say it in those words, but you say it in your actions. You say it in how you live your life. You live in fear of whatever is around the corner. But you know what? I'm here to tell you today. God is here to tell you today. Do not fear. Because I am coming with my vengeance. With my good dealings. With the benefits of God, I will come and I will save you no matter the situation. I am bigger than any problem that you'll ever face. I want us to hear that this morning. He says, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ, he came. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that's, that, those are the benefits of God. For the forgiveness of our sins, he says, I will save you. I will redeem you. I will buy you back. Next. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to give us sight. Not just physical sight, but spiritual sight. He came to, to unstop our ears so that we could hear his words. He gave us a tongue to sing his praises. And to speak the truth into this lost and dying world. And he gave us that water that burst forth out into the wilderness. That Holy Spirit that lives inside of us when he ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. He sent us his comforter, his spirit to live inside of us that burst forth. It says, Jesus Christ is here. He has come and he wants to save and heal you. Maybe, maybe your soul is, is a desert place this morning. Maybe you need that stream to flow out of you. Maybe you are that fear, fearful person that is living in doubt all the time, wondering what's around the corner that my God can't handle. Maybe your hands are weak. Maybe your, your knees are sore. 
I don't, I don't know what your problem is this morning. But God says, I'm coming to save you. He is coming to save you. So as we get started in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, he says, now it happened on a certain day. As he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come. Now I want us to stop right there for just a second. It says, now it happened on a certain day. Now I don't believe that Jesus Christ just showed up anywhere by coincidence. I believe he was appointed by God to show up at this particular place at this particular time. He was there for a purpose. Just like he's, he's here today, this particular day, for you. If you go back and you look at the, the Greek meaning for the word certain, it means unfailing. Unfailing. Trustworthy. Now, I don't know about you, but when you put that into terms that I can understand means that my God showed up on an unfailing day to save me. He will not fail. He showed up on this certain day for a certain purpose and he will not fail. What he has set out to accomplish, he will. And I, I, that, that spoke to me. I, wanted, I need to know the certainty sometimes. I need to know the certainty that Jesus Christ is in my life and what he set out to accomplish in my life, he will complete. And he will complete it in you too. Go to Psalms 118.24 real quick. It says, the day is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, I thought about that. When I thought about that unfailing day that Jesus Christ showed up in my life, and he did not fail. He saved me. I thought about, you know what? Every day is unfailing when I walk with Jesus Christ. Every day that I allow him to take part in my life is unfailing. It's successful. So let us rejoice. Because today is that certain day. It's that certain day for me. It's the certain day for you, if you will allow it, that Jesus Christ can, can make an impact, an everlasting impact on your life. Even if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he can still impact us every day. Go back to uh, Luke 5, 18th verse. It says, Then behold, men brought... Oh, I'm sorry, back up real quick. I don't know if we finished 17. And teachers of law sitting by who had come. Says that they had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I want us to think about that. The power of the Lord was present to to heal them. The Pharisees is who he's talking to right there. The Pharisees and the teachers, the ones that were sitting around listening, kind of questioning in their minds and their hearts who this man really was. He said the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Well, I'm here to tell you today that the power of the Lord is here today to heal us. To heal us, to heal us spiritually, physically, emotionally, what, whatever the case may be. Wherever that dry spot is in your soul that the water needs to flow out of, he's here and his power is with him. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and left let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. 
So they brought this sick man, this man that was paralyzed. He could not move. I imagine that he was paralyzed from the neck down, a quadriplegic, and he, he was having to rely on his friends to take him to the Savior. He was that sick. He couldn't move. He was bound to this bed. Now praise the Lord for good friends that were willing to take him to Jesus Christ. And, and when they walked to the door and they couldn't get in, they didn't stop. They said, no, our friend needs Jesus. We're going to find a way. We're not going to stop short. We're not going to leave him in this condition. We're going to persevere. We're going to move forward. My knees ain't sore. My hands ain't weak. I will get him there. You know, sometimes we need to, we need to be that friend to other people. Sometimes we need those friends. There's a lot that we could talk about and learn from these friends as they are on that journey to take their friends to Jesus Christ. But I want to talk about the man. I want to talk about the man that was laying in the bed. Why was he paralyzed? Scripture don't tell us. But I would assume that it's for the, for the glorification of Jesus Christ and God. Because he's laying there paralyzed and they, they let him down. Right, right in front of Jesus. I imagine that there was probably some hammering and, and some cutting going on and everybody's kind of like, what in the world's going on? And all of a sudden, here comes this guy, you know, being let down out of the ceiling. And he's... I take that, that paralyzed man to be some of us. Hey, I was that paralyzed man at one time. I had sin in my life. And it had me chained. It had me bound. And I couldn't move. I was stuck. I was in a bad spot. Where are you at this morning? Are you that paralyzed man? If so, he's here. His power is here. And not only will he heal you, he'll save you also. Just like he told the leper earlier in this chapter, he said, I am willing. The leper had asked him, Lord, are you willing to cleanse me? And he said, I am willing. He's willing. Ready, able. All we got to do is come. So I ask you this morning, what is it that has you chained? What is it that has you paralyzed? Are you fearful? Do you have doubts? Lust? Unforgiveness in your heart? Anger and malice inside of you? You know, I could sit here and I could name them all day long, but you know what affects you. God knows what affects you. He knows where your paralysis is. He knows the inner workings of your heart and your mind. Go to verse 20. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Now I want you to notice, he starts with what Jesus, or with what the man needed first. I mean, he could have said, hey, get up and run, take off. You know, hey, you're, you're physically healed, no problem. But he didn't. He started with what the man really needed. Sometimes we pray for things that we don't really need sometimes. Sometimes we pray for that physical healing of someone, and they may be lost and undone. We need to be searching for that spiritual healing, first of all. And that's what Jesus Christ came on this earth to accomplish was the spiritual healing of his people. That spiritual redemption, that bringing back and that joining back together with God the Father, that's what Jesus Christ first and foremost came to do, was to heal this spiritual aspect. And that's what he started with. He said, hey, you believe in me? You believe I am the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ? You're forgiven. You're healed spiritually. You're made whole. But you know, I imagine he's still laying there paralyzed. And I think he's probably in his, 
In his mind, he's probably rejoicing and saying, hey, I need that. I need that forgiveness because I recognize who this is. I recognize that he is God's son. I recognize that I have sin in my life. But physically, he's still paralyzed, just laying there. But you know, before we accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ through his blood shed on Calvary, any other type of healing profits us nothing. It is of no value. If he would have started with the, with the physical, if he had just come to heal us physically, we wouldn't, really, we wouldn't be any better off. I mean, if he would have just healed this man of his uh, being paralyzed, he would have got old. He still wouldn't have been able to walk. He would have died. I mean, it, he would have ended up kind of back in the same situation. But when God heals us spiritually, it lasts forever. For an eternity, God took care of the spiritual things first. Go to verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? You know, the Pharisees, they were kind of headed in the right direction. They, they understood. They knew. They had the knowledge that only God could forgive sins. But they lacked the ability in the spiritual sight, to see that he was standing right in front of them. They didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. And Jesus knew that. He says, hey, I know what you're saying in your heart. You're saying only God can do this. But I'm telling you right now, I am God. And he goes on and tells us in the next verse. He says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise up and walk. Next verse. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I want you to hear that right there. That's why, first of all, he forgave the sins. And then second of all, he's going he's gonna to restore him physically. And he says, to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Now he's taking care of the physical aspect. But he done this as a sign to those Pharisees to say, you know what? I have the power and I have the authority to forgive sins here on this earth. I have that right. I have that privilege. I have that authority. Because I am the son of man. I want us to look at that son of man real quick. And that's probably one of Jesus' favorite titles that he gives himself. If you, a lot of times when Jesus Christ refers to himself, he says, I am the son of man. Now, that does a couple of things. It, it, to, it points to his humanity, him coming in the flesh as, as a full blood and bone and flesh man. But it points to something else and We'll go to Daniel chapter 7 to look at the importance of the Son of Man. And these Pharisees would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said that the Son of Man has the power and the authority to forgive sins. Now these Pharisees were not dumb. They, they knew what the Old Testament Scripture said. And he says, I was watching, this is Daniel in one of his visions. He says, I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So, somebody that's going to approach the Ancient of Days, let me tell you, he's pretty important. Pretty important. Then to him was given dominion. So the Ancient of Days says, says to the Son of Man, Hey, I give you dominion and glory and a kingdom. I give you a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
Starting to sound like Jesus Christ, right? His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away. Hebrews says that it shall never be shaken. In his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. That's why he refers to himself as the son of man because he has inherited the kingdom of God. It's been given over to him. He has the power, the authority. He is the judge to all mankind. He's the one that we will stand before one day and he will say, you are forgiven and you are not. You accepted my sacrifice on the cross of Calvary? Enter in, my good and faithful servant. I don't know you, you worker of iniquity. Depart from me. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is the one that has the power and the authority to forgive sins on this earth. He is God. Go back to... Luke 5, verse 23. It says, Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Next verse. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. First of all, I want you to notice that, that when he had been forgiven, and when he had been healed, what God telling him to do? What did Jesus tell him to do? He said, take up your bed and go. And he listened. He obeyed. His knees were made strong. His hands were made strong. And God sent him out into the world and said, go. Go tell them. Let that water spring forth into those desert and dry places. So that my truth can be revealed. Chris, as you come on up. He ran away glorifying God. Lifting the name of Jesus Christ high. Saying, what a savior I have. Screaming at the top of his lungs the song that Misty sang, My Redeemer lives! i seen him today. He has come. On this certain day, this unfailing day, he showed up. And he spoke to me. He forgave me of my sins. He told me I would live forever in his kingdom that will not be destroyed, that can't be shaken. And now I'm going to go out and I'm going to serve him. Is that what we're telling our hearts this Is that what we hear in our hearts this morning? Is that, is that what our mind is speaking? Or are we paralyzed? Or are we, we stuck in the bed? Maybe your hands are weak. Maybe your knees are sore. But I tell you, God is here. The power that he has is here. To heal. To cleanse. To restore. To redeem. And to save. It says they were filled with fear. That's all. They were in awe. They were struck with the power that he has. It led them to worship, it led them to praise his name. says we have seen strange things today it was strange because they they didn't understand exactly who who he was it's not strange to me because I, I recognize the power of God they didn't recognize that power but you know what I would love to see some strange things today I would love to see somebody healed I would love to see somebody forgiven. I would love to see that water flowing out of someone. That Holy Spirit that fills them up to capacity 
and you can't hold it back. I would love to see those strange things. I need those strange things in my life. And as you stand, what's the Holy Spirit speaking to you? You know, let's get one thing straight. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Not me, not, not anybody else, but the Holy Spirit. He's the one that tells you that, that you need to come and ask for forgiveness. I'm just an obedient vessel that, that proclaims God's words that says you need forgiveness. That Spirit will talk to you. That Spirit will lead you into truth. And I'm here to tell you that that power and that spirit is here today. Are you willing to listen? Are you, are you willing to confess? Like we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Are you willing to confess and say that I'm wrong and he is right? Are you willing to confess that you have sin in your life? He says if you're willing to confess, I'm willing to forgive. I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Quit being stuck in the bed. Quit having weak hands. Maybe you've got a friend that you need to come and pray for. Maybe you need to come and pray for yourself. You know, I hear a lot of people say sometimes that they don't, they don't like to pray for themselves. It's selfish. Well, I'm here to tell you, you need to start praying for yourself. You need to pray that God shows up and works in your life. You need to pray that He shows up and works in the lives of others. It's time for us to quit being weak-handed and feeble need. It's time for us to, to shed the fear and the doubt out of our hearts. It's time for us to stand up and glorify God and say, you know what, no matter what, I'm forgiven. I've been redeemed. I am a 